What is up, Retro Maniacs? Welcome to Retro Card Chat Podcast. My name is Mike. I'm from Mike's Retro Trading Cards. And I'm joined by two men that promise, even though there was a lot of pushback and a lot of intense negotiating, but they promise not to burn any one of ones this podcast. They are Joe Day and EP. Why? What's up, guys? <laughs> why? Why would people why would you do that? Why would anybody do that? I don't know. They people think it's are, funny? I don't know. Or jerks, EP. <laughs> so, guys, I don't know if you noticed. I've been on a diet last couple of weeks. Looking I've lost good. about I've lost about five pounds. You can Congrats. see it. Congrats. Right. I, I've Congratulations. slimmed down. But the podcast, we're used to, you know, beefing up things because we're three beefy guys. Yeah. Since I you lost five pounds, that. I got to bring in, what, 155 pounds. We got a special guest. What? Mike... Bring him out of the green room. We got Ziggy No with us today. Wow. Whoa, <laughs> there he is. What's going on? Man, 155. Wow. God, I love you, dude. I, <laughs> I don't know what than us. <laughs> it's the camera angle and the trimming <laughs> of the beard. Hey, that's what it is. Okay. Maybe some yeah. HGH. Who knows? You know? <laughs> Whatever you have to do. You At know, my you age. Get to a certain point in life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's wow. a market for it. Well, this is new. We we've never done this before. I don't. I think. am honored. Yeah. This well, is our first yeah. first official guest to the Mike's Retro. What what's this show called? Mike, Mike's Mike, Retro Mike, Trade. We just did the uh, intro, dude. I thought yeah, it was sports card. Whatever guys. our show's called, <laughs> he's first guest. <laughs> All eight Welcome. people that watch are going to be very excited. But thanks for joining us. Hey. Well, you lost at least two, and they see me. So you're down to six now. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> we'll get we'll get a hundred more. But you, yeah, you'll, well, three will come back because they're upset that I was here. So you'll net one new one. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so tell me about this one of one. So if you burn a one of one, doesn't that still make it like more one of one? Like if there's, I don't know. I mean, there was half a card <laughs> left, right? Did you That's see the only half, one? half? Did you see that they, the, um, the uh, Vegas Dave burned that one card? That card was graded. It's in a PSA uh, slab and says authentic on it. Do you know what I'm referring to? That one. No. no, I didn't. But technically, okay. it would still be an authentic card. Yeah. Yeah, so right. so back in the day, Vegas Dave got mad. He took a Jordan sticker, the Jordan 86 Fleer sticker card, and burns it on camera and burned up part of it and made some comment of, you know, cards are going to be trash. And then apparently Steve Aoki, through that, that video those guys made behind the cards, Steve Aoki and Vegas Dave were in the same interview or something like that. Steve Aoki asked for the card. Vegas Dave gave it to him, and Aoki got it graded. And Steve and Steve Aoki has the graded, and this is now one of one, <laughs> yeah. wow. burned Michael Great. Jordan sticker card. Wow. And it's not yeah, like that. It's got Providence, too. It's been touched by Vegas Dave and by Steve Aoki, you know? By the way, that's, that's a unique podcast huh? in a row that the word Providence has been used. <laughs> well, once you, incorrectly, you didn't by really me. use it. Yeah. <laughs> I said Providence, and I'm like, I know that's not right. That's but why you and correct. I had no idea what you were talking yeah. about. Oh, you didn't know what I meant anyway. What are you talking about? <laughs> I hope I got that word right now. <laughs> <laughs> our our viewers will correct you if it yes, was. They <laughs> oh, they <laughs> definitely will. I thank them for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it. Uh, you know, last week we talked about Tops having the fake Babe Ruth autograph, potentially. I don't know. I'm not an authenticator. Yeah. But Panini this week said, hold my beer. <laughs> Let us show you what we can do. <laughs> National Treasures 2022 Babe Ruth one of one cut autograph. Beautiful card. Wish I would have pulled it. Only one problem. Apparently, it's George Brett's autograph. Now, I love George Brett. Don't get me wrong. He was my favorite player growing up. I still have a binder of all his cards I had from when I was a kid. But he's not Babe Ruth. And no offense to George. Not quite worth as much as the other George. I don't know. Who wants to start? Well, we have a guest. I mean, yeah, but let's let the guest. Go ahead, Ziggy. Okay, so, first. So first of all, I love this story. I'm gonna def I defended Panini before. I'm going to defend them again. I personally wearing think, his panini hat on our podcast. That's right. <laughs> one, that of, out. <laughs> one of two things happened. Okay. Either Panini had this genius idea and said, you know what? Everybody thinks we're sending loaded cases to breakers. We're going to teach breakers a lesson. <laughs> Let's put that autograph in the Royals team and we'll give the, the Yankees some terrible, you know, Royals thing and they can figure it out. It's still a one of one. They did deliver on the product. The Babe Ruth is in the product. It did get packed out. 
I mean, I think it's genius. Or, or, <laughs> tops. Like, <laughs> we've got to screw Panini. These guys will not give us the licenses. We're going to strangle them. Let's destroy their production. We'll get all those chuckleheads out there to talk about how they're terrible. Give up on Panini. They're awful. Which I think might actually be happening because, I mean, they did deliver on the product. Right? Yeah. Technically, uh, yeah. <laughs> I love the thought that they're that each each company has their spies in the manufacturing facilities and they're like messing around with everybody else's products. Like that, yeah. that I love that. That's it's the same manufacturer, most likely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we, we've seen we saw a tops card in a pan- pack of right, the panini product, product or vice versa recently. <laughs> that would explain so, I mean, I a it. lot of that the was, issues <laughs> that have been going on. <laughs> and there were rumors that Fanatics bought the printing presses, right? So wouldn't it yeah. be more likely that Fanatics is screwing with Panini? Mm-hmm. I'm just yeah. so so I'm I'm not as big of a conspiracy theorist as that half of the pod over here. Um <laughs> but I, this one though to me is so outlandishly like the the tops one it's like okay maybe a secretary signed it maybe a nurse signed it whatever but it was still yeah. you know this one is so bad that you really <laughs> hope something like what Ziggy's suggesting happened because <laughs> there is no way that someone can look at that card which is so what what would you think this card would be valued at? I mean, if it was yeah. actually Babe Ruth's oh, one of one, one, if well, it's again, an actual every, legit. Every one of these Babe Ruth cards are normally cut. They're all one of ones. And there are, there are, I'm, I'm not going to say there are a ton of them out there, but there are a number. Now, back before the boom, you tell me what they were going for. They weren't going for $15,000 per Babe Ruth autograph, right? Mm-hmm. I think that got inflated because somebody put a bounty on it recently. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, you know, here, here's even another idea. Now that this has been done, Tops could actually go buy a legitimate Babe Ruth autograph from the Brett guy and now put the legitimate autograph in the one that they didn't put legitimate autograph in for well, Tops. Well, let me stop. Right? A, a legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> depends, on, depends on which Brett, secretary yeah. signed it. Back. Well, I guess sure. No one's yeah. a, no one said that the that the that the Panini one was fake. We assume that one's real. So I don't know. If that one's real, then Tops is gonna buy it back and then give it to the guy they gave the uh the wrong one to. I mean these end up all being cut out of somebody's card anyway. Yeah. It's fantastic. I, you know, I will I will say one video, the best take I saw though on the explanation for this is Cards and Comics did a video on this. Um, he is uh, an actual guy in Q&A, does Q&A professionally, and he yeah. breaks this down as this is a breakdown in quality assurance. And also to go a little further, he points out that a lot of times these companies have no control of the manufacturer. These man, man, right. they control the contractors. Mm-hmm. And it's very likely that all these are just lack of, there's not enough quality assurance people. We all know there's supply yeah. chain issues. Yeah. There's also human issues. So I think to come out and blame the companies is wrong. Also, let's say this too. I know some people at Panini. I know people at Tops. They all take pride in their work, right? Mm-hmm. Many of them are collectors. They're not deliberately doing this. They're probably all equally embarrassed. What we'll see is how they respond, how they fix it. Um, but I yeah. think, again, we as, as content creators can get a great chuckle out of it. I think here's what I take away from it. We should be more aware of how can we fix this and how can we as a community like get hit tracking, right? Awareness on products. So that as we see mistakes, we can report them back and to be great at the, of the, of the manufacturer to respond to that and take action. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yep. Well, we talked about this uh, the last time, the last podcast where we talked about some of the screw ups. It's like how you're not sending people down there and, and quality assurance is, I agree is the biggest issue of this, but how, how are you not, ever vigilant after like the first couple of screw ups, how are you not down there really, really digging in deep to the manufacturing process and saying, okay, we really need to watch this now. This is, we're becoming kind of a joke a little bit. And we're all, like you said, we're all having our chuckles about it. And I agree, but you know, this is someone who paid for the Yankees in a break, which Yankees EP, I know you don't like Panini products for baseball because (laughs) they're not, they don't have any association. Right. So, I mean, maybe that's the whole joke, too. It's like it's not even a Yankees card. So what's it matter if it's George Brett's uh, signature? I mean, they're, they're still printing money, too. So that's yeah. probably yeah. part of the reason why. And how much was that Was that box of cards? No. Like, like National Treasures? Yeah. I'm sure National probably Treasures. Well, thousands, they're, they're, thousands they're, bucks. No, they're more reasonable. I think they, they were okay. I think they were starting around 1000 to 500 on the uh, okay. on their VI. What's that called? The um, first off the line. I could be wrong. Someone will obviously okay. correct us. But there are more <laughs> moderately priced. In fact, Here's the thing. I used to hate Panini baseball. I used to be very much, I bought license only. And I also did it because I felt like you stay in your swim lane. Panini, you're doing great in football and basketball. Mm-hmm. Do football and basketball. I'm not giving you money in baseball. I gave it the tops. 
with the stuff going on, I have now started to touch some hmm. because also I'm realizing in the future we're gonna we're not gonna have a choice, right? So you go <laughs> fanatics or you're gonna yeah. go outlaw, right? And yeah, um, right. whether it's Panini or Wildcard or Leaf. So I don't know. I'm I totally agree with you. Like my thoughts are, well, why were you buying freaking you know unlicensed baseball in the first place? Right. At least though, Panini has. There's been no arguments that that Babe Ruth autograph appears to be more legit than the Topps one. <laughs> you know, well, like, and I no mean, one's for George that Brett, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's definitely a George well, Brett auto. Again, they delivered on the product. They put in their Babe Ruth autograph. It's in there. The Topps mm-hmm. do that. The Topps put one in there. We don't know. There's a question about it. Well, we don't. In yeah. fairness, we don't know if Panini put one in there yet either, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so and nobody's found the actual Babe Ruth <laughs> autograph yet, right? Here's another thing this puts in question: is are the, all all the relics? Oh, right? yeah. Because mm. you now trust that those relics are Babe Ruth's relics, or are they, you know, Brett's relics? I haven't <laughs> trusted relics from Panini since I got back into the hobby. I, I got to be honest. Ever since they stopped doing the, yeah. hey, this is from this game. You know, like remember right. when you would get a dirty jersey, well, how cool it was. I speaking mean, of that, did even... you guys see all the people cutting open their yeah. their yeah. patch cards yeah. and yeah. like, I mean, <clears throat> none of none of the sets that they were cutting the cards out of were were supposed to be game used anyway. So it's really not, you know, right. not a big deal. But it's funny seeing like Jay Ajayi for a, a Jalen Waddle patch. It's right. like, you know, knowing <laughs> that it was actually a, was used Eagle by somebody or worn by somebody. Like, yeah, right. yeah it's kind of funny. But, but again, I, I did think that was funny. I was listening to somebody trying to, um, you know, when you think about where we are with the market, I mean, what do we expect is going to happen? Game used materials going to be harder and harder to get. They're not going to be cutting it up and putting it into stuff. I just don't think, yeah. Like, I don't know why we are so angry over it. I mean, I understand. Like, I listen to Hoops guy, Retro Hoops, complain about there's no game-worn material and it's ruining his hobby experience. Really? I mean, I just move on. Like, there's other things you can collect. You can collect so many other things today. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's digital, real. You can go meet some player and have a player experience and get a picture with him, an autograph. There's so many collector experiences for us to complain about. They didn't cut a jersey and stick it in my Well, park. the problem okay. is we as collectors or anyone that's interested in buying cards, we put a premium on those things. Like RPAs, yep. the out of 99 RPA, there's such a premium value on that. And it's just like I, I've been collecting Kenny Pickett cards, okay? his The RPAs of Kenny Pickett are triple what I would be willing to pay compared to like the, um, the select draft pick ones I've given where it's just an autograph. Why would I pay for something that has no association with Kenny Pickett whatsoever? You know, even well, the colors well, jersey. That's, 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 that's what he means, though. Like, he's, he's right. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Like us as yeah. collectors, we need to stop putting a premium on that ch- stuff yep. and just say, "Oh, it's just a cool looking card. It has nothing yep. to do with the player. Yep. It's just a cool looking yeah." The market. Piece of art on the the market card. is definitely a reflection of our our willingness to spend. Like that's what it always is, and a little like. I'll, I'll share a little secret with people about game worn stuff. Like we say that we like that and we do, but back in the day when, when it first came out, it was really hot. But after a couple of years, people really didn't care about pulling a game used Jersey card out of a pack of cards. Like yeah. that, that was something that was like kind of in for like a very short period of time. And it really didn't have the sustainable collectability, like, you know, autographs and some of the parallels and stuff it's, has. So well, there were so, really, so many more of those than the autographs. I think that's part of the reason why there was just so many of them there for, for yeah. a stretch, right? I mean, like if you have, like, it was really unique when Upper Deck started doing that, but then when everybody was doing it, it's not unique. Like, okay, well I have four, cards with brett Favre's jersey in it like do i need a fifth like so that's really you know i don't know maybe we have a different perspective because we were in it back then so we do like the game you stuff but at the same time i'm not gonna pay ridiculous amounts of money if that's what it's gonna cost to be able to buy one just because it has a little piece of a jersey in it i agree in fact here's a good example and i and i remember this mike you're right it was all about the autographs Mm -hmm. back in 15 and 16. It wasn't about shiny. It wasn't much about numbered unless they were very low numbered. It was about the autograph where you threw the like, for example, I think I think it was um select was either three hits, right? And you wanted them to be autographs. If you got relics, you're bummed. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like you weren't excited yep. about relics. Yeah. So when I think about too, is that what, what Panini and the manufacturers could do is I don't care about game worn, not worn, but give me sexy, cool, creative patches only. Mm-hmm. No more white napkins. 
All right. And let me piece them together. Like, give me names. Give me more name plates where I can put together my player's favorite name. I don't care if it's not game worn, player worn. But if you give me a bunch of, I can put Brady sets together, B R A D Ys, right? By collecting mm-hmm. the patches. Maybe the B is four patches, but just make every patch a good patch, a sexy patch. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Make it something that I'm excited about. I don't care about it. Stop giving me napkins, though. Because I don't want to Because then it just becomes napkins. a cool insert. Like, yep. and I'm fine with that. If you treat yep. them like you treat other cool inserts or make it a case hit or something, and, do something like that. So it is worth actually yep. going after like you. And that saying. case, and those are more valuable to me, those patches than a PMG card. If you make patch cards that are creative, like if you had the big, and I'm going to say the Redskin logo, the head, I know they're commanders mm-hmm. now, but if you had that patch, Redskin fans would collect that because of the patch. They'd like that. You know what I'm yeah. saying? They like the patches of the uh, Giannis pat- name. So give me patches that I can collect. And each one of them is going to be more creative than anything else. Another and, thing I'll just mention, too, while I'm on this kick is I hate the parallels where it's like the same player position over here is a gold, silver, bronze, green. How about you take a player and you show me him at four at four phases of the game? Here he is mm-hmm. dribbling. Here he is right. passing. Here he is going up. And here he is dunking. And the dunking one is the low print one, right? Mm-hmm. Him dribbling is the base card. Him passing is the 599. You know what I'm saying? Like, give me a scene. Make the creativity in the collection. They used or to do that with a clear show. Players. You used to do that with Flair Showcase and Top's Gold Label, right? Like, yeah. I mean, that, that was yeah. awesome. I love that. Yeah, I yes. love that. And they sets. had yeah. the cards that fit together. Be creative. Like, and this is what kills me, man. There's no creativity in sports cards anymore. Oh, we've no, talked about that yeah. since day one of, yeah. of us doing this. They just the show. do what they do and keep churning it out. And you, yeah. you know who was the, the founders of that, though? It was never Tops. Tops has never been innovative. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of shocks me. Pacific. You're right. For me, Pacific, upper deck, upper, depth, upper deck, yeah. even yeah. even I'll give this Panini saved the NBA. OK, the NBA license was was falling apart, apparently, 2010. And this I'm getting from Wax Museum did a video on this. Panini was given the exclusive license. They didn't fight for it. Right. The, everybody didn't. Mm-hmm. They didn't want it. They gave it to him. Panini saved basketball. Panini's RPAs. Why is National Treasure such a big deal? Exquisite made it. But it was Panini that made mm-hmm. the RPA a bigger thing and got it into football. Tops is the least innovative, worst managed oh, yeah. company. They've always been. Tops mm-hmm. and, and Beckett, all they have are names. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? No, like, I love the Beckett name. Yeah. But I will defend terrible. Top Stadium Club. The inserts from Top Stadium Club in the early 90s were really, really good. Those three okay. by threes. The, um, the, the thing is, though, with they Tops, they, they, were all, they always lagged behind. Like, yeah. Look at the die cuts and the triumvirates and stuff. Like Pacific was doing that years before. Oh yeah, crazy. So stuff like that. it always. I remember very specifically that Tops would always be the last company yeah. in the '90s to come out with that hot things. So, like there were all the other companies were already doing that thing that collectors wanted before Tops were like, oh well, we better do this now. So yeah. they weren't. They were more like jumping reactive. on the band. Yeah. They were reactive, reactive instead, instead of being innovative. Yeah. So yeah. very good. Again, work. during the boom, during the boom, they were so mismanaged. They were hemorrhaging money needed either an IPO or getting swat. That's how bad that company was. And we like, we, I don't know why everybody's such tops fans and everybody gets to give tops a pass and everybody just, I, like I've said before, Panini it's longevity, is going, I would think it's we name. It's have, not. Yeah. Yeah, it's name value. because Panini, in my opinion, will be the rebel rebellion that we're going to be supporting probably in the future. Because I think Fanatics is going to be awful. I don't think anything mm-hmm. Fanatics is going to deliver to me positive. Mm-hmm. Even the point where I used to believe they're going to be direct consumer, so I get a better price. Like I heard somebody say yesterday, if they could change something, they'd want to have the, the ability for me to get a price at more suggested retail price. All Fanatics is going to do is going to charge me five hundred bucks for the same box that they're charging distributor for. They're not going to treat me better. I don't see yeah. any reason for them to do that. Yeah. Look at the prices aren't though. going down. <laughs> well, I'm curious it. about that though. Like a box of Topps Chrome baseball, what's that cost now? Or Bowman Chrome baseball? What's, what's oh, Bowman Chrome is more expensive, but yeah, it's, Topps Chrome is like a hundred, I think, and then yeah. Bowman Chrome is like three hundred, I think. Right, yeah. and then you look but, at maybe the counter. That is what Prism 200. is probably the Panini counter to Topps Chrome or Bowman Chrome. I mean, that's like four, five, six, seven. Fifteen hundred dollars a box, depending. You know, select is a fifteen. It'll be interesting box. to see if well, the football, but you're well, you're not buying the fifteen hundred dollar box prism. So if they're charging five hundred for tops chrome, you're still gonna say that's a lot of money because it's a lot of money. Right, but I you know I might or, tops chrome. <laughs> I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I'm not gonna it, lie. Yeah. I love I love me some tops chrome. Yeah, I was never yeah. I never liked tops chrome that much. I don't care, and I don't. I'm not a lover for prism either. In fact, I've always felt prism was a lazy card. But it is recognized in the market, has great resale value. 
Um, even optic is a strong number too, because we all love the mm -hmm. rated rookie, right? Mm -hmm. I would rather see rated rookie cards in the future than I would rather see, you know, Chrome tops Chrome. By the way, to two things that Panini did not create: the rated rookie, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or Prism. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. They did, they're a great marketing company, right? They did a great job marketing. They were, they were, again, they were a well-run business. They had more patents. They had more, you know, better marketing, better distribution, global reach. Um, it is what it is. I, again, I, I got a lot of reasons I didn't like Panini, and I'm not <laughs> loving Panini, um, but they are what they are. I also they, say this, too. They are doing NFT re, um, physical crossovers right now, too. They're the first one to do this, which I will tell you, I think it's the future. You can collect, I think it's so many different NFTs, and when you do that, however many are collected, they will mint that many cards and ship those cards to individuals. And of those cards, I think the first one they're going to encase or something like that, they're doing special giveaways for these mm -hmm. cards to get collectors involved. Um, so I think I think you'll see more of that in the future as well. Isn't that what Brian Gray is doing with his uh, superhero card? <laughs> no. The, uh, print to order? <laughs> no. <laughs> Similar. How many did you get? How many Brian Gray's I, I did you get? Come I on. did not get any. It's just not something I, <laughs> I'm interested in. I'm not. You know. Well, I just not. That's not my business. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I'm going to move things on a little bit. There's been a little, a lot of talk recently about addiction in, in the card collecting hobby. Picked up this little story. There was a Homeland Security special agent in Arizona that recently lost his job and was sentenced to two years probation and $134,000 in restitution for using his federal vehicle to moonlight for Lyft, Uber, and Amazon while he was on duty for Homeland Security. <laughs> now, I'm yeah. laughing as I say this. It, it really shouldn't be a laughing matter. But Did he have classified documents in the vehicle? I, I, I don't know, and I'm not touching that. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Where but was this? It was Where? in Arizona, yeah. He was apparently addicted to sports cards and he needed to make money. He just, he was buying so much. He was having stuff sent to friends house. Like, like, and his friend even told him, dude, I, I, my mailbox can't take all this stuff. He was just buying and buying and buying and got himself into a hole. So he decided to take his federal vehicle. And while he was working, go, Hey, I'll give you a ride. So yeah. Wow, a lot to digest there. <laughs> yeah. What a dunce. Well done, as we like to <laughs> what say. a dunce. Do you think he, like, did he ask people for their identification when they got in the car? Because if they were illegal, did he take them out? And if they were, he'd give them a ride. I don't and know. Because if he did that, double. he's kind of doing work. I'd like, like to know, is that an Uber XL? Or what, what's, what's the what's the classification? Do I have to pay a little extra to be <laughs> carried around in a federal vehicle, I it's assume? A, it's a honeypot. It's a premium. It's a honeypot. <laughs> he's tricking them in and he's deporting them. But right. he's oh, them yeah. a ride, yeah. Apparently he wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> I, I tell you what, I, I find this amazing that he's going to blame this on sports cards. Like I would have to look at all his other addictions. <laughs> yeah. Right. You're yeah. telling me sports cards is the one you're going to blame it on. <laughs> there's no blow in the back seat of the car. No, right? there's no yeah. girlfriend. <laughs> right. You know, no OnlyFans account. Oh, yeah. No, no, no poker, no poke online poker account. Yeah, no online yeah. Yeah. gambling. Yeah. Not on FanDuel. Those cards. <laughs> Did he not um, know how to sell cards? Is he only buying? He right. must have been, or he had a lot of bad luck. I don't yeah. know. You know. I uh, watched a great video that Chris Sewell did um, about buying a collection, and he went to this this guy's long, very long story short. Watch the video, by the way. Uh, go to baseball card collector, investor, dealer in that order, and watch the video of him talking about buying this collection. And he was talking to this older gentleman, and he the the guy was very standoffish, and. Crystal was like, kind of like, well, what's going on? Do you want to sell this? What's the deal? Well, he later comes to find out that it's his, the older gentleman's son had an addiction and he would just mm. buy, buy, buy wax. And he just had video, yeah. these tons of pa almost pallets worth of wax that he just opened. He would go to card shows or card shops and card shows and he would buy stuff online. And he just, he, it ruined his life. And, um, the uh the guy just couldn't even be in the same room as the cards mm. to the point where the dad had to call and say hey this is what he's offering is this okay and he had to completely take himself out of that situation i mean it's scary we all you know all of us have have different addictions we struggle with mm. i you know you know maybe maybe alcohol every now and again but not you know <laughs> no I'm, I'm dry i'm dry for three weeks i'm good um <laughs> 
You're, but, you're you know, a functioning drunk is okay. I am functioning. <laughs> very, I, the best podcast are when I have a couple in me. But, uh, Pacifist. but no, I mean, we all, we all have the, we all have our, our addictions and it, it's, it's scary. I, I, as much as we're joking around, I, I could totally see this being an issue where the guys mm-hmm. easily with the cost of what cards are nowadays, oh, yeah. with the cost of ripping wax, yeah. which I'm sure if you have an addiction pack opening is like mm-hmm. a scratch off ticket. You're like, you're waiting to hit the big one. I can't, I can't imagine how much he, he must put in that to risk his job, his career, his livelihood, all of that stuff to be willing to risk that crazy. We, okay. We've all talked about this a number of times where um, it's so easy to spend the money to, to get new cards, to find, mm-hmm. to, to hunt, hunt new cards and get, hunt new packs and hunt new boxes and to pay for it. And then, you know, you, you, like, again, we've also said you try to sell some of that stuff to kind of make some of that money back. And that's a little bit more difficult. It's a lot more, a lot easier to just push the button and say, yes, send me this right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I said, that's the thing I think has bothered me the most. I love sports cards and, and we all know that there's addiction in everything. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of people prey on people with addictions, right? Mm-hmm. Because oh, they yeah. know that, for example, and this bothered me during the boom, liquidating cards is a very hard thing to do. The most, the most important thing to do to liquidate cards, you have to have rapport in the community. You have to mm-hmm. be trusted. If you're a trusted mm-hmm. individual, I can get cards, I can get cash for cards pretty quickly. But if you're mm-hmm. not, if you just followed some channel, told you to buy a bunch of cards, and you go to liquidate that because the market caps up at fifty dollars, and you've got five million dollars. <laughs> that's all bull card, bull garbage. And it just bothers me. And then you see people prey on that because they know. Well, I know you need some cash, man. I know it's hard to sell. It. I'll give you eight hundred for it. You know they they do that. In fact, a great example mm-hmm. you'll hear some of these dealers talk about. And I I understand the business. They set up in communities that are poor and impoverished communities like pawn shops, and will buy cards at fifty percent. And they'll walk them over to their card st- store and they take them to the card shop and sell them at, at regular price. And they know that, right? I mean, also we know that it's the best way to uh, move illegal activity, mm-hmm. right? Cards <laughs> right. are very easy to liquidate. There's no mm-hmm. tracking of it. Yeah. Right? So in those communities where cards can become cash very quickly, and I don't mean any, it could be any community. Right. But you mm-hmm. can see people prey on people for that well and that's why you're seeing you know with with being able to get money for cards you're seeing a lot and there have been a lot reported and and i don't know if you ever had this issue mike but people people ripping off card uh card shops i mean i've seen a couple of videos now just last couple weeks like big card shops burbank Mm -hmm. cards in california like that that's a pretty big store i believe they were ripped off recently like it's crazy if you think about it especially if people are trying to you know Trying to find money somehow, yeah. trying to do something to, to to cash in on it. You know, it's 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 scary. And well, when again, I had my shop, I had like I had like the other issue was like I had people bringing in stuff to sell me that I didn't know where they were getting it from, and I didn't know what they were going to use it for. And honestly, that was one of the reasons I closed my shop. I mean, I got into selling more than just cards. I I did video games, movies, stuff like that. But like, like you could kind of tell when people were bringing you stuff in what they were going to use the money for. And it like, Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. didn't sit well with me. Like Mm -hmm. there were times that I had people come in that I just wouldn't buy stuff from. I'd tell them I didn't need it or I wasn't buying and stuff because I, I just felt gross knowing that yeah. they were going to take this money and go get their fix of yep. whatever it was. Billion. And like, it was yeah. very uncomfortable and like this kind of a business like lends itself perfectly. Like we joke all the time about, you know, big card sellers working for the Navarro drug cartel from <laughs> Ozark, you know, but like yeah. it happens. Like if you want to launder money, this business is perfect for, for mm-hmm. that. And there's just, I don't know. It, it It's a little scary. And when I had my shop, it was just really scary because I didn't want to be out money if somebody stole something. And like, it was my responsibility. If I hadn't sold it, I had to give it back. Like that's the uh-huh. law. People don't like some people seem to think, well, if I paid them money for it. Yeah. But it's still stolen property and you can't right. have it. You have right. to, if a police officer came in and said, somebody had cards stolen from them. Did you buy them? And I say, yeah, the, I bought them from this person for this price. Guess what? The cop is leaving with the cards that yeah. I bought and it's up to me to get the money back from the person. I now become part of the criminal complaint. And yep. if they're found guilty, then they're supposed to pay restitution and they never do. So like, that's like a, a lot of it. Like I've had people too. We had one guy that, you know, three of us know that came into my shop that charged up a lot of credit card debt 
on buying cards. He was coming in every day. This is like 1993, maybe. This was early 90s. And he had the same addiction of wanting to rip boxes of cards every day. He would come in and spend like two, three, four hundred dollars. And I knew it wasn't going to last. I knew he was putting on a credit card. I knew it was going to get to a bad spot, mm -hmm. but like it was a weird spot to be in. Like what, what's my responsibility? Yeah. I'm here to sell it. I can't really police what he's doing with his money or how he wants to buy, but it, it it's really gross. And like, I don't think the addiction side of this is really talked about enough. Well, say one thing that bothers me, I'm thinking about your scenario. Why isn't there a database that you put the card into that goes out and searches to see if it's in a stolen database, like pawn shops do with a gun, or mm -hmm. other diamonds or other collectible items. Like, why is that not in place? My only assumption is it's not there because people don't want it to be there. Mm -hmm. And this is why I kind of made a video earlier about how I think are bad people good for the hobby? Like, it seems like the hobby is the only place where we have problems and they continue to persist and no one changes that. Like, it's a oh, no brainer, yeah. simple thing that every product should be registered. And that registration should include the checklist. And as those cards come out, they should be hit a hit list. And you should know when you buy a product, what hits are taken in the product. You don't have to give me the print run, but I should have knowledge of it. And when a card is stolen, fake, counterfeited, it should be put in a database. It ideally should be taken out of the market, but it's not. What often happens is the guy who gets it, he's embarrassed that he bought a fake card. It mm -hmm. finds its way in a goddamn repack, which mm -hmm. is one of the reasons I loathe repacks and people who support them. This whole industry... I love it, but it's also, it's like, why are we not fixing it? And I'm angry that we have no leaders, right? Like everybody on this channel here, if you guys had the clout that some of these other, and I'm going to say ass clowns had, we would make real changes. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's what bothers me. Like I'll, I'll go on a little tangent here. Jeff Wilson, I've known him for a while. Okay. I, I would say I was a friend of his. I used to call him. I was involved in his Facebook group. I'm disappointed on the fact he's not a leader. And I've told him that I said, you've been in a position where you could be a leader. It is what it is. It, you know, Jeff does what he wants to do, but there's no leaders in the damn hobby. And all we mm -hmm. do is attack each other. Like I'll give Jeff credit for bringing attention to the Panini damn hologram issue. He was the only major channel who brought that up. Remember that, that these holograms are showing you kabooms are in the card. Hey, Panini, we need mm -hmm. you to get back to us. Mm -hmm. And then we blast them on the PPP loan shit. And no one wants to talk about Jeff. And again, I don't care about Jeff and the PPP loan. I want Panini to answer me on the boxes and the holograms. I want changes in the hobby. I want hit tracking. I want, a, like you said, I want a store to have the confidence when a guy comes in to sell the car, you can look it up and know it's not stolen. Yeah. Right. There should also be a number that you can call that you're right. If somebody's coming in, he might have an addiction problem. You can help these people. There's so many things we could do. And I just don't know why it's not happening. I mean, I hope, it, I hope it happens. And nothing has changed from the time I opened my shop in the early nineties. We just have more ways to do it now. Like all of this stuff has always existed. And like, that's the weird thing for me. I, I was in this hobby. I made a living from it for 14 years. Then I walked away and I didn't pay any attention to it for like another 15 years. And then I came back and nothing has really changed. Things are on a different level yep. than they were before, but really nothing has changed. A lot of the, the, you know, the pump and dump people were doing that back in the nineties. Yeah. Like this is nothing new but nothing has gotten better. Like we've talked about it a lot of times on the podcast, like how has 30 years gone by and this hasn't changed or this hasn't changed. And like, it's not going to, if it hasn't already, I don't think. Like I'll give you an I example. Think, how is a card not perfect? It's 2023. Exactly. We make yeah. microchips, microchips with bazillions of little transistors yeah. on them. <laughs> And we still cut cards crookedly. <laughs> yeah, right. They're worse now than they were 30 years ago. Yeah, Chrome, Chrome the, the amount of flaws on the on the surfaces of Chrome right now and prisms compared to what it was back in the 90s. Like I feel like it's way worse now. Yeah. But but Not that ties into what I was I was going to say a little earlier. It's like imagine you know our friend with with the a little bit of a box a pack addiction, right? Imagine if he if if the prices were what they were now then. Yeah. Dude would be yeah. homeless. I mean, yeah. you're going yeah. in and you're buying a box of cards for <laughs> your 60 bucks back in 1993. You're, yeah. you know, the the crap product is like $300 now, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, you know, to, to that point, it's like, there's, there's just so much money being spent. 
especially, you know, you have products like Flawless and, and National Treasures. They Maybe they don't need to come out of the box perfect, yeah. but they shouldn't have rounded corners. Yeah. They shouldn't have like creases in them. It's like you're paying $4,000 for this box of cards and it, you still can't find a way to ship it safely that it doesn't have, have the rounded corners and, and torn up edges. It's It's mind blowing. Yeah, it should be flawless. I mean, it, right. I've made that joke numerous <laughs> times. It's not immaculate and it's not flawless. <laughs> and then I want to point out, then you still have transcendent above that, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. you have, was yeah. it eminence above? And there's still, it's ridiculous. Like, I don't know. The stuff you can get in cards and the stuff they can, they, the quality should be better. They should do a better job. Although I do give them credit for the good names. Yeah, they really hit that <laughs> scaling name. Well, I'm pretty sure that uh, Panini got those good names from Playoff. Wasn't it Playoff National Treasures? <laughs> was, <laughs> was it Immaculate? Someone else Panini, Panini's Italian. They're close to the Vatican. Think of the names. Immaculate. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. Eminence. Right. You know? <laughs> but, I think there's like somebody from the Vatican coming over with a list of names. Here are all the wonderful biblical names you should go with. And I Panini just, also trademarked many of those names too. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to go back to the, to the one part about the issues in the hobby. And I think one, one of the issues is and not an issue. Like everybody loves a good card show, but in Pennsylvania, a lot, a lot of States, Pennsylvania included, like you can go to a card show and set up and not have to put in your tax number. So like all, all the money that changes hands is, is, uh, is cash. And yeah. like, it's uh, that's a, in my opinion, like there's a lot of stuff that can happen. Like there's, and uh, there's in Pennsylvania, you could probably go to a card show pretty much every weekend. And I, so mm -hmm. that's, I think that, that allows more things to happen. Well, tell you, I started most of my card business when I got back was in Facebook. I was in what I refer to the Facebook underground from like 2015 to 2020, where during when you'd see peaks and valleys and other things, the Facebook community was still very strong. You'd see that slow down, too. But mm -hmm. these groups where you can razz cards or sell cards are just nonstop. I mean, all the time. Um, and a lot of them have their communities where you have to be vetted in. Um, they, they do a very good job of keeping fraud out and keeping bad actors out. So, um mm -hmm. Cool. I, By the way, how the government has not come after the Raz thing and and tried it. That's gambling. I mean, what what is going on? Uh, like people, they people do. will eventually get in trouble. Yeah, yeah, I'm that's, sure that's they that's do. That's crazy to me. Well, that, well the thing no is, trying to shut that down. They are when you think about the tax code that they they changed. That six hundred dollar mm -hmm. was really to go after that community because razzing really is it's razzing sports cards is one thing. I know people who raz um what's it purses. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like they <laughs> yeah, raz. Everything, not exclusive man. to to yeah. our hobby, yeah. And razzing is raffling, and if you do raffling correct in certain states, it can be considered charitable. So right. there's a whole. I mean, like random.org, the whole website. It's I think 95 percent of the people that are using it for using it for razzing. You know, yeah. they're not using because yeah. they're looking for a random number. Razzing and uh, group yeah. breaks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. razzing and breaks. But again, it's amazing. It's not just sports cards. There is a whole industry. Like I, I found groups you can get um wholesale products. You could buy them at wholesale. You could buy the whole Raz, right? If you want, mm -hmm. I don't know, a case of uh, whatever it might be, you can get in the Raz or buy like, it. Are you going to get Amy a purse on a Raz? That's that's the next level, right? Might. You got to get yeah. a Raz for your wife. You got a you don't have to tell her where it wife. came from. Yeah, no, no, never would. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move us along a little bit here. Uh, main topic I want to talk about here today is been a lot of talk about whether you're a collector, whether you're an investor, whether you're a flipper. You know, we make fun of some of the other groups here. We kind of associate ourselves with the collector group. You know, we're true collectors. But really, at the end of the day, like, why do we, like, I think it's stupid that we have these groups, these labels. It's so 2023 that you have to be this or you have to be that or you have to be this there's no gray area there's no in between i feel like we're all three i sell cards i buy cards hoping that maybe they'll go up in value i might like the card it might be somebody enjoy collecting but that doesn't mean that I'm like, oh, I don't care if I spend $100 for this card and it's worth $10 tomorrow. I do. Like, <laughs> I'm just being honest. Like, all of us really do if we're being honest with ourselves. Like, I just, like, I don't understand the separation. Like, there's no right and wrong way to do the hobby. Yes, we associate with being collectors. And I feel like that's, like, our base for everything, but it doesn't mean that we don't want to invest in cards, have our cards be worth a little bit more money. It doesn't mean that if we, somebody comes up to us and says, here, here's the 86 clear Michael Jordan. You can have it for a hundred bucks. And you're like, it's worth more than that. No, take it for a hundred. doesn't mean you're not going to turn <laughs> around and sell it 
for a thousand <laughs> or two. Like, you know, so we we do all three. And I just I feel like the the segmentation of the hobby is just kind of ridiculous. It is, but tribalism is kind of where we are so right now as, 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 a people, yeah. as a people yeah as a people like like tribalism is a thing and like we want to be with the people that um we associate with and we want to hate the people or not, not hate but we want we're in a tribe we, we, we and then tear have down, sub tribes within yeah, we, the tribe right yeah we want to tear down the other the other tribes because they're not as good as us uh, you know mike you sent something to uh our our text thread last night and it was from someone on twitter who we all kind of joke around about a little bit and the roller coaster of emotions we go on whenever they post something <laughs> on Twitter. Um, and, and they posted, is it even a PC if you're going to sell it? I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah, you can PC things, but still sell things. I mean, I have, I PC Brady cards. If Brady won a super bowl in, you know, if, if they were still in the playoffs <laughs> and they were going to win the super bowl this year and everything jumped in value again, of course I would sell this stuff. I <laughs> love my Brady PC, but I'm also not stupid. So I mean, I can hold those two thoughts in my head that I can PC someone, but then uh, someone may also made a point. Well, I can sell a card that say it's, you know, I had a, a Brady Fleer Ultra, just the base SGC eight. I sold that. Then I went and bought, took that money and went and bought a PSA eight gold medallion Fleer Ultra Brady rookie. So it's like, maybe you're trying to kind of build up your, your PC. Like, yeah, we do. We have this like tribalism thought that whatever we're doing is right and virtuous and true. And it's mm -hmm. the real way to do it. And then anyone else who does it differently is doing it wrong. They they obviously don't know what they're talking about. I feel like the bottom line is on a long enough timeline, like everything is going to be inventory is going to be sold. Like whether you do it because you need the money or like you pass away and your cards are still here and somebody else sells them. Like on a long enough timeline, everything is going to get sold. And if you're, you know, I, I just feel like um, that's kind of what collectibles that's and more collection it. is, right? Yeah, but, but. <laughs> well, yeah, but that, that's, the, that's the truth, though. Like I feel on a long yeah. enough timeline, everything is kind of for sale. I, Whether you I, change your collecting or, or. One thing I love about sports cards, I think they are a good mirror of humanity. Because I think everybody has an ethical code or a little meter mm -hmm. in you. And I think how you react in sports cards depends on your ethics. And to give you an example. What I have a problem with, and I called out, was Merle World for telling a guy that he was at next to the booth that this card is his PC card. He loved to have that card. Man, man, I wish I had that card in my PC. And the guy says, man, that's a PC card for you? I'll sell it to you. I'll give you a good price on it. I can relate to this because I think many of us ethically are like that. If one of you guys told me, man, I love, I don't know, XYZ, and I had it in my collection, and it was selling for 1000 but you really wanted it, and I said, hey, man, I'll give you 500 that's a great deal, but I'm helping a collector. We can empathize mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. What's wrong, I find, is if you immediately then take that relationship right. with the guy that you got and then flip that card the next day for more money. Mm -hmm. It's not that you are moving your PC up or trying to get better. You lied to that person about that being important to you in order to get a better deal. Right. And then you took that to make more money and profit off that. And to me, that is the definition of the difference between a sports card collector and a sports card investor. Because I have always felt in the Facebook groups I was in, when we would sell a card, it was show me the comp or three comps, and then you are going to sell it at 10, 15, or 20% in our group under the most recent comp because you're giving this community a cut. You're saying, hey, man, these boxes are normally, they're, they're fleecing you out there for 100. I'm selling them for 75. Then you felt good. You're making a little bit of the money so you can fuel your addiction. That's fine. And you're not taking advantage of other people. That to me is what this hobby was about. Right. Because, again, I wasn't a baseball card collector. So I saw Bowman. I pick it up and I trade it for some prism. Right. Sell it for a little bit more. But I didn't take advantage. What has happened is that we've come to the point where we are trying to maximize the profit we get. Right. Mm -hmm. At any cost. And what disgusts me is when a guy will tell you, man, I got this card. I picked it up at eight hundred dollars. The games this week. I sold it for a hundred for, for fifteen hundred bucks and he lost the game. You knowingly know this is a declining asset. And you mm -hmm. found the maximum value you could from someone else before it left. Again, ethically, that's your choice, man. It's your, it's a business world. Do what you want to do. People do that. I look at like cars, right? I sold a car the other day to a friend of mine for 800 bucks because I didn't think it ran. Okay. <laughs> he got it working, got it fixed. He took another car for me too. That was a junk car. He offered me more money after the fact. He's like, man, this is a great deal. Can I give you more? And I said, no. 
I'm fine because we made the deal. And this is where I think the difference between collector and investor. It's an ethics where you are in that little ethical meter. Are you trying to maximize the value off of everybody or only some people? And I'll even put it this way. I treat everybody the same way. I'm not trying to find the collector who will pay the most. I'm trying to find the collector who's going to keep the card. And I'm going to collect that memory, that mm -hmm. friendship, whatever it is with it. What bothers me more than anything is if I, and I've told these people, if I sell you this card a great deal, just please don't tell me or don't let me see that you resold it later for more. Right. And if you do, mm -hmm. I understand because life changes. Just you know, understand I, how I feel about it. You know, I'm not going to call you out on it, but just understand I'm giving it to you for a deal. And I've always felt that way. I will continue to live that way. If I'm looking for collectors, I'm going to flip a little bit where I can because I know the I know the market, but I, I believe there's a little ethical code there that. You know, there's certain things I'm just not going to do. Like you said, Mike, earlier, you felt at a certain point that the money you're giving to some guy was going to something you didn't want to be involved in. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, when we let this be such a business about profit, and I've, I've been calling this out for two years, there's no goddamn investment money coming in this hobby because real investors look at this the same way. Guys, if you're a Wall Street investor with hundreds of thousands of dollars, <laughs> you're not looking at sports cards. I'm going to go buy Luca cards. Yeah, you might no. look at I'm going to go buy into the businesses that transact out of sports cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. That take money off the table, like collectible. I can't stand the fractionals. And I'll say it. All they do is extract. You add no value. You're not making the pie bigger. You're eating from the damn pie. Right. And there's so many businesses out there. And I think that's why there's this investor versus collector mentality. I don't also I'm I'm just like you said, I'm all three, but I am definitely more team collector. I love to see idiots lose money on cards because <laughs> it teaches you a lesson. Now, I feel yeah. bad for people who, who are the idiots sometimes, but if you're a greedy guy and greed is your motivator, it, it's, it's yeah, I'm cool with are. it too. Like, yeah. like this guy sold me a Tom Brady rookie card for like well above comps, and I ate it because he's a good friend of mine. You know, he told me a, a quantum leaf 2000 Tom Brady for 275 bucks, <laughs> PSA wow. seven. That's God. probably like a $225 card now, but this dude call knew. him out, call him out, do it. <laughs> Do it. I can't. I can't. I can't. Didn't, I but didn't that friend. person? But not, didn't I'm that person? Gonna, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say who it is. But didn't that person try to give you more of you more money? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. What a jerk that guy was. Wow. <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> Full disclosure: He did say, Joe Day, you overpaid for this. Even though I'm paycheck to paycheck and can barely afford my rent, I will give you <laughs> some of that money back. He didn't try and guilt me at all. But yeah, he did. He did offer. He I know offer. the feeling too, because when I went through my cards, I got a Tom Son of Brady a bench, Bowman Chrome <laughs> PSA eight, and it's a very valuable card. And this guy got me. He he bought it. I, I don't even know how far under comps. He was like four, five, six hundred dollars under, and he beat me really bad on that one. I'm not going to mention any names, <laughs> but it was yeah. Me. <laughs> it was me, but here's the thing now. That card has cooled. It is about what I paid for it now. I should have sold it though. Man. Yeah. See, that's that's you should have to your point. To your point, Ziggy, though. It. You should have sold it to somebody else. Yeah. That's right. I should have sold it back home. Back home. And then but, bought it back. But to, to your point, Ziggy, that's that's if Mike gave me a really good deal on that card because I, I really wanted that card for my collection. That card spiked. It went up to like a thirty-five hundred dollar card. Now Mike would have sold it well before it hit that thirty-five hundred. You were about to put all of them on eBay, and you actually put a couple of them on, so you would have sold it for about that anyway. But if I was a dick, and when it spiked to thirty-five hundred, <laughs> if I was spike and it spiked to thirty-five hundred, I would be a dick for selling it then. You know what I mean? Like I didn't feel I wouldn't feel comfortable selling that card. Yeah when it spiked because Mike gave me such a good deal on it. He also gave in that deal. He gave, gave me a press pass Brady rookie card. I would never sell that. Card. Ooh, I like, forgot that was, about that. What yeah, the hell was I know. I thinking? But, well, he's making up for EP screwing me. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's a card that I would never sell because a person gave it to me as a friend, knowing that I'm a Tom Brady collector and he gave it to me. It would be just a, a total dick move to, to go and, and sell that. I think, and one of the things to, to Ziggy's point too, like the like when the um when that person said, well, "I really want that card, I really want that card for my, my PC," like you're not going to change your mind that day and go and sell it the next day. Like, it, I mean, uh, you can change your mind eventually. You're going to change your mind eventually, but mm -hmm. if you were doing that and then selling it right away, it's just because you wanted to flip it and, yeah. like you said, just being greedy. Any like PC card could become not a PC card at any right. time D okay. down the line, but like not tomorrow. You know, yeah, like not tomorrow, yeah. like this week. It's, you know it's what I mean? the conversation. See, it, you, you knew, he knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And then, and that thought right. was even funnier. If you follow the story was, okay, so Merlin buys a card and he sells it to the great curator for, I think, $6,000 or $5,000. Oh, 
right? And then here's my the favorite part. Keeper, right? The great curator sells it to Daps for 16500 okay? Then Daps comes out and tells everybody, this is a $100,000 card. And I could tell you guys, I cannot stand Daps because Daps <laughs> is still, to this day, trying to sell that card. In fact, yesterday, I love his math. And here's what concerns me, guys. Everybody's paying, paying attention. Daps is a sponsored content creator from Fanatics, okay? Fanatics looks to him as somebody they use to get their message out. And what he said the other day was, here's his logic. A card sold the other day was a PSA 9 for $2,500 or $2, as a PSA 9, which means if it was a PSA 10, that's $7,500, right? Oh, of course it is. And he has <laughs> yeah. the one of one, and that card was one of 10. So his card's 10 times the PSA 10 that doesn't even exist anyway. So his card's worth $75,000. <laughs> Everybody just nods their head and agrees. <laughs> Now that's well, when it's a one on one, you can set your price, baby. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I understand. I can't, I'll tell you what, I'm cheering. I, I want everybody to continue to know how much he paid for that because I cannot wait for the day he has to sell it for less. It will make me happy. I oh, will there are people, that we all seem like really sweet guys, the three of us, I'm sure. <laughs> we are. There are there are Gosh. people on Twitter we see stuff like that happen to, and we're we're pretty pleased with it because you <laughs> see people who kind of act like jerks and 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 do the pump and dump thing, and oh hey. I'm going to give you a deal on this card today only. Like, okay, sure. Mm. If I came tomorrow and asked you for that deal, I'm <laughs> sure you would. It's like the com the infomercials you see. Yes. If you call right now, you can get two of those things for the price of one. You know, it's kind of so. So but again, whenever it goes back, people get screwed, we love it. It's the ethics I meter. My ethic meter goes off the freaking chart around something like that. And I'll, I have no problem by some saying, I just don't understand you. You have a potential to have a great voice to do something for the hobby. Why are you doing this? Like, what is your intent? It has to be evil. Like you can't tell me you're ignorant. Yeah. yeah. And the people who support him, who get on channels with him and, and, and go, oh, well, he's a good guy. He gave me a good deal. Again, I go back to what I said before. Do we just not want to make this a better place? Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's try. Yeah. Let's try. Like, I almost sometimes feel like the hobby's like more like the walking dead. Right. <laughs> and there's really a lot of zombies and a lot of governors out there and a lot of Negans. And this when we're together in our community, we're really strong together. And that's why we find so much camaraderie in the community because there's a separation of two or three degrees between really good people. And then there's a freaking bunch of Negans and governors out there. I was yeah. going to use the Wall Street analogy with uh, Gordon Gecko. You know, the whole greed, greed is, good is good thing. I mean, everyone <laughs> everyone seems to be okay with the, the greed part of the hobby, especially if they're making some money, right? Like a lot of the a lot of those it. people, though, they're only in it to make money. And yeah. like they're the people that will be the first ones out. Like yeah. they're allowed to go. Like, probably. Yeah. I, I did say, you know, we are all three, but the thing is not everybody is. And like, that's what I'm trying. The point I'm trying to make is like investing and flipping isn't necessarily bad, but if that's the yeah. only reason you're in this hobby, it is like, you're just trying to come in and take advantage of the people here, make money and leave. And, mm -hmm. you know, the high end cards, why are they all dropping? Because all those people that came in and bought that stuff up and sold it out of the profit, they made their money and they're out of it. They don't give a damn about the card. It was a transaction. It was a way to make money. And if you don't at some level care about the cards, like have any connection to it, then you're just in here to to rape the hobby of the money and those people can go f themselves yeah. i don't care if they lose i hope a lot of those people do lose money and that'll be maybe uh -huh. a deterrent to people for doing it in the future yeah we'll see yeah. okay so i also wanted to talk a little bit too since we have ziggy here about content creators roles in all of this separation of investing and collecting you know you were talking a little bit earlier about before we started the podcast about the sports card youtubers hall of fame and you know i they're a very strong collector base you have the jeff wilson's of the world and the other the blez and all the other guys i don't even know their names because i don't watch their channels because i don't give a flying f about what they're doing on their channels but you know they're all about you know making money how you can make money how you're going to make money what card's going to be the next one and like you know it, it feels to me like youtube plays a big part in all of this segregation of the hobby because you have people telling people just this and you have other people telling people just this like i was a little surprised you know 
sports car dad dustin did his video which probably wasn't the best video to post about it and i think he did realize that but like in the comments of it all the people that were calling him out for like not being a collector like you know you could think whatever you wanted about the video and it was probably not the best idea to make that video to begin with but like he does collect cards so like i was kind of surprised to see not only you have the investor people that like laugh at people like us that are happy buying a two dollar card but <laughs> then you also have the collector people that are very possessive and tribal about their part of it going well you're you're just in this to have a youtube channel and make money off it you're not a collector and you know i i want to talk a little bit about content creation and and the drama it causes sure. i guess would be uh, let me start by saying i i want to defend justin i i like dustin a lot i rub him mm -hmm. uh, probably wrong a lot um he probably considers me a friend of me i heard him use that term the other day <laughs> i think he just i think he was out of touch in that comment when he made it and i what surprises me is he didn't make a video making nominations first like to participate since he knows what it is and then come out and critique it well you know that i made my comments what i suggest is do x y and z and here's why right why he got those comments from collectors, I think, is that a lot of people question your motive for why you're in sports cards. I get that a lot of times from people, too. Well, Ziggy, mm -hmm. where's your collection? What are you here for? What's your reason for doing this? I look at kind of the coaching trees. So think about this, Mike. Before the dot com or dot dot com, that's how old I am. Before the. the <laughs> I am, too. Before the sports card boom, there weren't many YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. Most YouTube content was either guys sharing their little PCs or breakers breaking cards and the breakers had tons of followers Layton, whatever because people like to watch it but there was no content there weren't people coming out and telling you you can invest in sports cards the mm. i word was a bad word okay no one said that and most of it was a little just like i said showing your pcs so fast forward to where we are today there's all sorts of content there might be too many pieces of content what the youtube hall of fame was designed to do originally was just simply to get more people looking at more youtube content that was what they deemed positive to the community. Mm -hmm. And a little story on that. Mike, baseball card collector, apparently was one of the first people involved. He had 700 subscribers back in this day. 700 subscribers when he made the <laughs> Hall of Fame. I also understand. We for 700 subscribers, Ziggy. So, uh. yeah. <laughs> well, again, <laughs> we have like 12. <laughs> you're going to get there. A anyway, the point was, is he, he put together this group. I, I believe Sports Card Radio was somewhat involved, according to Snoop who's another channel, like Sports Card Radio did a bunch of content. Anyway, here's my point. They were just sharing, hey, look at other channels. Here's other channels to look at. Mm -hmm. Last year, they changed the requirements to say it was too easy because of the dot .com, dot .com boom. Because of the <laughs> COVID boom, it was too easy to get, to get people to vote for you. So they made this thing. You had to have three years of experience, and you had to have a year before you could vote for somebody. And they made that just simple to make it easier. And what he came out by attacking that, say you should have 5,000 subscribers and 1 million views, just yeah. showed how out of touch he was. Those guys have no interest in getting 5,000 subscribers. Many of them upset them that you even said that. Yeah. So to kind of bring it all back, where are we today? I think we have too many people who, that either come from the coaching tree of I want to make money, and I call them the Gary V or mm -hmm. the Jeff Wilson coaching tree. And then you've got the true collector coaching tree, right? The OGs, the guys who started channels just because they had a channel. Now, many of them embraced 2020 and tried to grow with that. Right. Mike Baseball Card Collector, I think, has over 6,000 viewers on his channel, which he's not even his primary channel. He got a lot of that during the boom. Right. So where are we today? I think we're in a better place than we've ever been before. There's a lot of great opinions out there, a lot of great voices. But I always tell people, look at what their motivation is. Like, why are they doing it? Mm -hmm. And again, going back to Dustin, Dustin's motivation is money. It's money first. It, it's, you can't tell me it's not, Dustin, because if it truly was collecting, you truly had an addiction, you would turn it off. You take 30 days and stop. You'd walk away. Many of us have. Many of the collector community does that from time to time. Life interrupts. But it is a business to him. It's a revenue stream, and that's fine. In fact, in his, his apology video the other day, he announces his two new sponsors, which, again, I think is ironic that you tell us that, you know, I, I don't know. It, it, he is who he is. But I always look at channels like that. They're doing it for profit. Channels like a, a collector's dream is doing it because he loves it. Mike is doing it because he loves it. Now, bench clear is doing it more for a profit. They've bleeded towards the profit side. So I understand everybody's, you know, what their reasons are. You guys would love to go to what 10,000, 50,000 subscribers, right? You'd love to have sponsors. Yeah, we just want the money, right? We want, yeah. we want it's, beer it's, sponsors. It's sponsors. And, <laughs> but again, what here's my point that what would you do with the money, right? It goes back to what I said earlier with your ethical channel. 
would you use the money to buy a car and a Porsche like the Backyard Boys? Or would you probably put it back into cards and giveaways and stuff in your community? Right. That's what I think you would do. And that to me is a difference, right? If you have a join button, it's a join button, Neo, so I can open cards for you to come <laughs> I don't take know a who look that at. Is. I don't know Neo, who that is. And Neo, take, I don't know. And then take a look Ohio at my, cards and comics, you mean? And his affiliate links, right? So, so pay my affiliate links so I can buy cards. And guys, it, it's, just, it's an ethical thing. To me, it, it, it's very clear. Look at what their motivation is behind why they make their content. So, they love what they're doing, then love what they're doing. If they do it for a profit reason, they do it for a profit reason. So I, I will say this, and, and Dustin's a friend of the channel. He's He's been supportive of us yep. just as you have, and and he's he's called out our channel. He's actually going to be on uh, doing a, a segment that we're not going to – we're teasing a little bit that you'll also be on. Uh, don't, put, don't put this out first then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. He's a good guy. Like – so in terms of like, I, I, I'm very hesitant to ever suggest that someone who admits they have addiction is lying. I'm hesitant to ever say that. Whether I agree with it or not, I, I would I would be hesitant to say what he said is untrue. So I'll, I just want to put that out there because Fair. there are people who aren't willing to put it out there and they're willing mm -hmm. to hide their addictions whether he does or doesn't, and I think there is a point, I think he does personally, but whether he does or doesn't, it's actually good that he's saying that he does because maybe it will help other people who actually do feel better about talking about it. That's my yeah. whole thing. And and I've messaged him about this back and forth about, you know, different addictions that I have in life and other people have in life. And they're real. They're out there. You know, we kind of made fun of it earlier, but they, they, there are people out there that have that addiction. We knew someone Mike brought up specifically. So like, I'm hesitant to say that. I'm also hesitant to say he's not a real collector either, which was a lot of the comments that he was getting. He shows off, like, he shows off cards. Like, he talks about Stranger Things Stranger cards things mm -hmm. that no one watches. On, like, you can look <laughs> yeah. at his video counts, and this one's when he talks about his, like, excitement, and he nerds out over the Stranger Things stuff. You can see it's real. So, like, I'm hesitant to ever say that he's not a true collector either. I will agree to, to a point that, you know, content creators, they need to be that they're kind of fit into these little, little silos, right? So there are those OGs, those elite co threes, those, mm -hmm. those Chris Sewell's baseball card collector, investor dealer, like there, there's guys like that, that have no interest to the point where elite co three doesn't monetize his channel because he wants to use the song in his intro mm -hmm. at the beginning mm -hmm. of his videos, mm -hmm. which he couldn't monetize because it's like an actual song from mm -hmm. some band. Like mm -hmm. that's all to me, that's awesome. Yeah. But like, then there are other people who say, you know what? People are watching me. I am giving daily content. They enjoy it. Why not make a little scratch on the side for it? I have no problem yeah. with that. And, you know, you can be a true collector and also put out, put out content. I mean, we're nowhere near the, the viewers that, you know, you are, or, or uh, Chris is, or Dustin <coughs> is, but we, I, I feel like you're, you're right. That if we did monetize this station or this, uh, this, uh, uh, podcast, we would then put the money into cards. I, I would anyway. Or would well, you put it in the beer? <laughs> that, that would help the channel too. I have no comment. Well, it depends if we were being sponsored by a beer company. Trump's I just come make, at us. I want to make enough money to be able to pay for this StreamYard premium service. Every month. That's like really and my to get goal us new, with this uh, channel. Sweatshirts, Mike, and to get no, sweatshirts. no sweatshirts. We yeah, get not part of the deal. Card sweatshirts. <laughs> we get Ziggy one. Ziggy, you're getting a sweatshirt. Tell us your sign. Everybody gets a sweatshirt. <laughs> well, I say I, again. I I agree with you. I do think he's a collector, and I don't knock that. What I think what I think Dustin is very related to is that Dustin is a perfect example of the real new collector came who really knew nothing about sports cards. Like Dustin pretends like he's been in for a lot longer. I'm not questioning him, but his purchasing is questionable. When you're buying fifth, sixth, seventh year Brady cards and PSA nines and tens, I don't understand that. Like real collectors buy rookie cards, autographs, buying 15, 16 year vets and pulling them up and showing them and calling them, you know, that that's, he's, look, I, I just, I think that's interesting. Also, he never sells. I don't think he knows mm -hmm. or does much selling. You know what I'm saying? I don't think he's established a selling platform. And what I mean by that is many of these influencers, their selling platform is they get on whatnot where they can sell to their, their viewers. Right. I sell all the time. I don't ever want my viewers to know about my selling. I want that to be separate. That's one of the reasons I don't share my collection world, PC world. What I can tell you is I buy and sell cards all the time. I can tell you too, I get most of my cards through breaks and ripping. 
And it makes me sick when I hear these guys talk about how breaking's for idiots and everybody loses money and breaks. Breaking's like gambling, okay? Mm -hmm. oh, it's definitely. poker. You're people who make a living in poker. Mm -hmm. There are people who make a living in breaking. And we do it off the idiots who don't know what the hell they're doing in breaking. I love breaking. Again, I'm very Mike's, good at Mike's what I do. Some breaking. Mike's gotten some yeah. into wrestling breaks. I, again, I can go yeah. over it, man. You have to know the product. You don't go in like an idiot. You, you go into the right breakers. I buy in cases. I'll buy many cases at a time of a certain team. And for the most part, I've always done very well. I grade cards. I'm patient. Um, I cast a big net. I use breakers that I trust. I also, I'll tell you another tip that I do. I hang out with certain breakers so that if another guy has cards that I want, I can buy those cards from him direct, right? So like I see Frank open some cards in a break. Hey, Frank, I'll buy those blank, blank cards from you. And the breakers are mutual connections. So he'll make the deal for me. I send the right. money to the breaker. The break, you know what I'm saying? It's a great way to get cards. It's, it's a, there's so many secret ways. I love breaking. But I love again, watching breaks. I, I love, I, it's my background noise. If I'm doing, if I'm throwing stuff up on eBay or if I'm uh, organizing cards, I'll throw up Leighton and I can't watch stand them too. So I, I actually don't mind them. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not a backyard guy. Are you I'm banned. Guy, I'm banned by Leighton. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story for another time. That might yeah. be a neat question. Actually. I I'm, I've I'm, never been banned by a breaker. I, I'll nine. put it this way. You ask Rich Leighton about me. He does not like my name and he wishes he could say something bad, but he can't. And I'm not going to throw him under the bus, but I'll just put it this way. There was an issue that I called him out on many years ago. It was like 2016. He went nuts on camera. The video is hidden, but he knows who I am and what he did. He corrected it, but we know I no longer break with him. I'll say that. And I know a lot about the breaking world. For example, a lot of these breakers do have big whales that clear the board for them, right? Yeah. So, yeah. again, you have to understand breaking. I, I, I hope that Fanatics breaks the breaking world. I hope that they get registered breakers because I do think that you should have some recourse as a consumer and not be held by the breaker only. I think it's a mistake. Because well, again, the manufacturers like they break themselves. That. It sounds like they may want to start doing get into the breaking business themselves. I I, I don't care. I, I just want to know that I can go get a good price and a trusted place. I'll tell you that's one thing too. I hate the fact that a breaker tells me that it's because of his hot hands. Bullshit, <laughs> dude! You're a gift a unwrapper. <laughs> right, right. A gift unwrapper. You are. You're a doing gift all the fun. <laughs> That's all you are. Like people wrap yeah. presents and they get paid money for Christmas. You're a gift unwrapper it has nothing to do with what your hands do but you have the bleep button right <laughs> <laughs> we and can't monetize this video the best the best breaker is bargain box breaks i think he has a youtube channel but he's a facebook guy he is real like he'll sit there opening the product product and tell you oh man panini screwed us on this one. Oh, this is a terrible box <laughs> yeah. how the hell this was terrible value and we get a good box he's honest he does not give you bullshit. He's a great yeah. breaker. Very good prices. Love the guy. So anyway, I digress. <laughs> he is not a sponsor. I, he is no. <laughs> yeah. All this. I'm going to have to cut all that out. <laughs> you know, it's like when EP talks about his other podcast. <laughs> I will tell you, I'm, I'm actually looking. I did sponsor some breaks in my channel in the past years where I've given spots away to breakers. I'm going to probably do something like that in the future because I would like to do more about educating people on breaks. Okay. Um, because I do think it's great, but I don't think you should go in blind about it. You should understand mm -hmm. what you're doing. Uh, but I love the cost breaking. of products. It's it's I, I couldn't buy a whole box of national treasures, but you know what? Yeah. If I wanted Kenny Pickett, maybe I'll pay for the Steelers spot. You know, it's I, I do I do appreciate that. That's what I've been fact, doing too yeah, with the with the wrestling with the stuff. Chronicles wrestling. Yeah. Like those are what $120 a box. You get a couple autographs out of it, but like I opened a box. I yeah. got crap out of the box. I'm like, <laughs> I would rather pay, you know, for four or five different case breaks with yeah. the, the person I want. And I'm probably going to get something out of all that. And I have, I've been pretty lucky yeah. with that. So yeah, a lot of it's just patience. Hot. It's patience. A lot of people, you get the hit, they try to sell it too quick. If you grade it, you make a pro. Like I have a complete process every month. I send away cards to get graded. I send cards to comp C. I send cards to eBay. Right. And you just continue this process. And you, if you're breaking, that's just feeding your machine, right? Mm -hmm. And you're enjoying have you ever the done hobby. Any reveals, Ziggy, when you've done uh, grading grading cards? Have I have, I have posted some. I haven't had any. I had some big, big box uh, PSA release come back last year. Um, I just submitted some stuff recently. They'll be coming back. I normally, here's the thing. I normally don't put it out till after I've sold it, because mm. I want to sell it. I don't want to promote it and then, oh, he's trying to sell it. He's trying right. to sell his card. So I normally right. sell the stuff. Right. I and also he, he sell did with that Jordan PSA yeah. that he got. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I was too excited by that. It worked. It worked. <laughs> and I'll tell you too, here's, here's what I do for selling. When I get stuff in, I normally post it on eBay with some high price. 
I'll look at the offers that I get. Then I'll take the offers into my Facebook group and say, hey, look, I got an offer for a hundred bucks and this will take 80 for it. Right. So I normally take an offer that I have and go under the offer to Facebook friends. But I'm just using that if I have to. And sometimes I'll accept, you know, Facebook or eBay stuff. Um, but I, I that's I love that as a way to also price stuff, too. Like I have some stuff out that's got high prices and I wait to see what the offers are. That's and, how I do it. I think all of us do know. it that way. We put it, we put, yeah. uh, you know, mm -hmm. buy it now or best offer. That's the way to do it. And, and I've surprisingly had people app. pay sometimes. I'm like, oh my God, I didn't yeah. need it for Not even put it in offer. I've had people <laughs> yeah. do that. I'm like, yeah. you know, there's an OBO. We've talked about that a lot too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You crazy. lose money on the long run if you run auctions. I mean, yeah. you have yep. one or two hot things that might go over, but you're much better off doing a fixed price with the best offer, so. But I am doing auctions. I'm using DC87 now, because um, I've gotten to okay. a point where there's some, some cards from them. that I, I hold, like you, like you said, I keep them on the buy it nows and they're not getting any activity. I'm like, you know, I just need to stomach it and just sell it. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. do sell for losses sometimes or under, like, in fact, if you sell a card on DC whatever at 99 cents, you net four cents. <laughs> oh, nice. i've netted four cents on many cards wow. but i'm also right now like okay well i paid 18 for it you know lost so that helps out in my you know yeah. expenses but yeah. i think you have to get in that process if, if it's a if you're selling or making a machine because i use the money to feed my habit to get right. the cards that i want right so it's just yeah. about and that's the right way right. to be an investor right yeah. is yep. you know <clears throat> i sell stuff to buy other stuff i don't sell stuff to pay the rent you know yep. like that's not that's yeah. not how we should look at it you know yep. All right, guys. Well, that's pretty good chat this week. Ziggy, where can people find you? Ziggy No. Just look Ziggy No on YouTube. Ziggy No on uh, Instagram. That's pretty where you find me. I have different names. Um, if you find me, you want to. I find other people. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thanks for being on, man. I have really, yeah. really enjoyed this, guys. I love awesome, it, man. man. This is I great. look forward yeah. to you guys doing more of this with other channels. I'm going to be talking to other channels about you guys. I'd love to see you guys uh, participate in Hobby Palooza which comes up in the spring. If you're not familiar, check that, that out. Is. Yeah. So again, that is something that back in 2020, when um, Jeff did the virtual, because we had no national, right? The mm -hmm. collector community was a little upset about that. And they built the Hobby Palooza event that coincided with the virtual. Oh, I knew both okay. groups. I was working with Jeff at the time. And I mean, working with Jeff meant I was volunteering with Jeff, Amazing asking, <laughs> in the summer. And I was helping Bench Clear. Anyway, the Bench Clear guys did a, a community version of that. They then did it again each year. And all it is is really to schedule like two days a weekend of back-to-back -back channels, and it's a handoff. One channel, the next channel, the next channel. Last year, they had a charity involved as well. I think it was uh, Signatures for Soldiers. I'm um, assuming they'll do it again this year. What's great, again, is you get to meet other collectors. You can either you know participate, do whatever you want to. I do encourage everybody out there, if you see this video, check out the YouTube Hall of Fame. You, don't, you have to have a channel for one year for your vote to count, but if you're a content creator, Make some recommendations. The whole purpose is just to share new channels with people. And I'll awesome. leave you with this. The one thing that people ask me what I collect, I realize what I've been collecting for the last few years, I love collecting YouTube channels. I really have like <laughs> over awesome. 600 of them right now. Wow. And every time I see a new one, I'll go follow it, subscribe to it. And many of them will go dormant, but I do love all the YouTube channels out there. So I'll leave you with that. Awesome. Great stuff. We thank you for being on. And other than that, good chat, guys. See you next week. See you, Thanks. boys. Adios.